Thanks. Have I pronounced that right? Thank you. I was trying to avoid pronouncing the actual name. That's what I was trying to do. Thanks, Les. Um, thanks for having me along, folks. Uh, good to see some familiar faces. I was actually uh, North, North Wales uh, Section Secretary for a few years when we used to meet in Ch uh, Chester. I managed, I managed to hand that one over to Lynn. 12 years ago. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to be back and uh, back where my railway career began. So, I started at Rail House and Crew in 1990, and uh, we covered the North Wales patch which was, um, I thought was really, really good. And I was really disappointed in O for Q that crew became into city civil engineers. And we lost North Wales and Mid Wales um, to the Birmingham office, I think, and the Liverpool office. And uh, yeah, I thought I'd never ever work in North Wales again. And then uh, joined Amco Giffen a few years ago and uh, the opportunity came up to join their engineering team covering North and South Wales uh, to work on the structures framework contract that we have. Um, I, I was absolutely delighted. And then my first job, um, not with Amco, but my first job on North Wales was, was Traith Mower. So uh, Traith Mower is a timber trestle viaduct across the, the Glaslin River, uh, just outside Port Maddock. And um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, just a very loose agenda of the areas I'm going to cover uh, as a bit of background and history to the, to the structure the scope of the contracted work that AMCO Giffin delivered, uh, a little bit on the design, um, quite a lot on the access and the environment and flooding, because that was, um, <laughs> that caused us no end of uh, problems. Um, and then uh, the construction activities that we carried out in three blockades this year. And then a bit of anxiety I had uh, around commissioning and completion of, of the structure. Um, so there's a, a photograph of the timber trestle viaduct across the river Glasslin just outside Porth Maddock. Um, very tranquil setting um, and it's not always like that. Um, and I'll come on to that and show you some photographs and images of, uh, of how rough it can be to work in that, that environment. Um, so just to locate us geographically You've got the uh, you've got Portmatic there. You've got the cob across there, which was built um, for the for the road and the railway to get access to the harbour at Portmatic. You've got um, Snowdon up here. Um, the River Glasling comes down from the Snow Snowdonian Range. Then you've got the railway across here uh, between Minford and Portmatic. And this area here is called Traith Mower, which means big sands roughly translated, um, and the timber trestle uh, bridge that c carries the Dovey Junction to Patheli um, across the estuary there, um, Dovey Junction to Patheli, 118 miles, 40 chains, or 118 and a half miles. Where is that from? It's from Shrewsbury, I think. It goes all the way down to uh, Dovey Junction. And then back up. It's from, I think the mileage is from Shrewsbury. Yeah, I think it was originally from Church, yeah. So um, I'm sure Fred will correct me if I've got any any any, any of this wrong, because Fred was around when it was built. Um, originally built by the Aberystwyth and Welsh Coast Railway, the section from Dovey Junction to Valley <coughs> opened in 1867. The engineers uh, Benjamin Piercy and Henry Conybeare who were also the engineers for most of the timber, well, all the timber trestle viaducts in North Wales, including Barmouth, Penryn Drydrith, and, and a few others that are, are still remaining. The engineer who actually, the contractor that built the structure uh, from Oswestry Street was Thomas Savin. Um, the original structure was a lot bigger than it is now. Uh, it's been modified lots and lots of times over the years it's been there. Different types of uh, of timber have been used, softwoods including pitch pine, Douglas fir and hardwoods including ecky and greenheart. Um, most recently the structure has had some quite major investment to keep it going. Um, 
this is phase one. There is a phase two supposed to be coming up as well with, with more works to the structure. And you'll see why, why the structure needs so much, so much work done into it. Um, the structure was originally 40 spans. Um, it was rebuilt in 1914. It's 21 spans. And then at some point, I can't quite, I don't know quite when, uh, between 1914 uh, and more recently, it was, uh, it was again that the abutments and banks were brought forward closer to the river to bring it to its current 16 spans. And that's uh, 1899 Ordnance Survey extract, which shows the 40 span structure across the estuary, Traith Mower, uh, and there's a, an 1893 photograph. Um, which shows it again 40 spans and that's snowed and blooming in the background. Um, this was um, the 1914 drawing which I managed to get hold of out of the archives which shows uh, the scheme of when it was reduced from 40, 40 spans to 20 spans. So quite interesting uh, drawing there. It hasn't actually got abutments, it's actually just got an embankment that sits under the trestles there. Um, but eventually, when it was done to 16 spans, there was concrete abutments put in, it, in each end. And you can see those trestles in, in dotted there, they were removed and the embankment built. And then these intermediate trestles were probably the original trestles, were replaced by uh, more like the current trestles that are there now. And actually, the, the existing trestles are still on site. Uh, the intermediate original pit, uh, piles for the trestles are still on site, evident and in very good condition actually. You can see that um, the piles under the water and in, in the riverbed are in remarkable condition and, um, and, and that's what, and I'll come on to that in a little bit further uh, where we position the splices for our, for our new piles. And so that's um, general arrangement for uh, elevation of the existing, existing structure. So it's 16 spans, 15 uh, trestles, concrete abutments each end, a uh, single track going across, um, span, the spans between the trestles around about six metres, height above water about three and a half metres, depending on the tide of course. Let's talk at great length about the tides. Um, so AMCO's project scope was replacement of the timber structural members including piles, a crosshead, corbels and edge beams, and uh, I'll, I'll describe what those are later. Um, replacement of all the associated metallic fixings for those elements, bolts and straps. Replacement of all the handrails. Uh, there's no track work related to this particular project. We did have to jack the way beams, uh, the longitudinal timbers that the rails sit on to enable us to access um, parts of the structure to, to replace. So this is what the project was all about. It was about um, rectifying the defects in the structure. You can see there the structure was suffering from, uh, from rot and decay, uh, particularly around the jointed areas where the water gets trapped between the, between the members. Um, but then some of the elements were softwood, um, had been put in by various different reincarnations of the railway, and the softwood obviously doesn't last as long as the hardwood sections. Again, it was all about getting as much hardwood in there and replacing all the software. There's a couple of piles on trestle five, suffering from, again, um, quite severe rot and decay. Um, not always exclusively to the jointed areas, uh, but certainly um, you see why interventions were, were required. Again, a few more de defects to look at. These are the, the diagonal bracings, which were softwood. You can see that they've decayed quite severely around the joint areas, even though we put new bolts have been put in, the um, structure was still prone to, to decay. This is uh, an extract from the 3D model, um, which was feature extracted from uh, LiDAR point cloud uh, to enable us to produce an accurate model uh, of the structure. Uh, that accurate model was absolutely essential for ordering timber sizes. Um, so this, this is this is feature extracted from, from Point Cloud and enabled us to, to use it for both timber sizes, the drawings and the design, and also some animations we did for um, 
some visualisations to help us to plan the job effectively. And uh, I'll show you the animation uh, later on. So just to describe the elements of the structure so you don't get too lost in, in the jargon. So the, 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 this is a standard trestle, well they're all standard trestles, but um, sits on piles four or five metres in, into the, um, the riverbed. The piles extend up to a crosshead, uh, which is the main part of the structure. Uh, you've got lower whalings uh, at this spot, at sort of low water level. You've got the diagonal cross bracings right up to these, to these crossheads. Then you've got corbels that sit on the, um, over the crosshead and support the edge beams above the corbels. Uh, and then you've got the actual uh, span beams, uh, rail bearing beams that span between the trestles here, which support the deck and the, the way beams that sit under the rail. Uh, you've got timber posted handrails and metal, um, metal railing along, alongside the railway, these walkways either side. So uh, very similar to Barmouth in some respects, but this is more symmetrical than Barmouth. Barmouth has its uh, walkway on one side, whereas we've got walkways on both sides, although it's not a public highway. There's no access to the, to the public to the structure. There's five spans in the middle of the structure, uh, which have got outriggers. So in the deepest part of the river, the structure has, got, has been braced and strengthened with these outriggers. So you've got additional piles either side of the five piles and holding the trestle up with uh, outrigger whalings and the outrigger itself. Some photographs from the top of the structure showing the old handrail, timber posts and um, metal rails, very, very poor condition. Um, the way beams themselves, um, the track system, lots of Great Western Railway base plates out there from the 1930s bullhead rail and a bullhead check rail uh, on the outside of the of the of the, the running rails there. So this is a schedule of the elements which we were contracted to to replace. So the edge beams were in fairly poor condition so it was 32 edge beams to replace. 15 corbels, corbels were very in, again in, in, in quite poor condition. Uh, resin packing to the main beams, we didn't have any main beams work to do but there was resin packing and, and steel, steel packing to, uh, to some of the main beams. Uh, and again, packing to, the, to some of the better condition corbels. We had one crosshead to replace on trestle four. Um, we had seven piles to replace throughout the, the, uh, throughout the structure. There was a diagonal whaling to replace, um, some outrigger diagonals to, to replace as well five horizontal whalings, that, that's the lower whaling at the, at the water level to replace. Uh, and then the, the associated minor works and the handrails was, was replaced as well. This is one of the design drawings taken from, from the model. Uh, this is the uh, proof of construction version of the, um, the drawing. So this is trestle nine. Trestles are numbered from low mileage to high mileage. Low mileage is the Menford side, high mileage is the Port Manic side. Um, so this is trestle nine, typical um, drawing. We're working on most of the, the trestles. So there's two piles to replace um, on, on trestle nine. There's an outrigger to, to replace uh, two edge beams at the top, um, handrails uh, and the associated metallic fixings, bolts and straps in relation to each element we were changing. We also had temporary works for the scheme. Temporary works were predominantly to allow us access to the elements for, for jacking the structure. This was one of the biggest pieces of um, temporary works we had on the structure at uh, Trestle 4. Um, this was to allow us to change the crosshead. So the, um, the temporary works designed for us by Maybe um, was, a, was a system of, of beams and, and columns uh, with jacks at the top to allow us to, to jack off the lower railing to allow us to lift the structure enough to, to replace the pi uh, replace the crosshead. Um, difficulties we had is that we had to make sure that all the components we were jacking off, components of the existing bridge, were hardwood and not softwood and um, that all the, the fixings had to be re replaced in the first place. So that caused us a, a 
few issues as, as well to make sure that that was all in place before we had to do some testing of some of the, the, the timber because we didn't know whether some bits were hardwood or, or softwood. A few other elements of, of temporary works. There's a, a prop, a prop there, which allowed us to, to replace uh, the outer pile. Um, again, it was a navy system, and then there's just a bit of detail around that the, the hydraulic jacks that we had uh, for the different uh, activities for the jacking the structure up there as well, all supplied by uh, navy. But we also had to do some analysis on the structure to enable us to. Um, operate RRVs on, on the track side to make sure that we hadn't taken out elements and weakened the structure so that the, the RRV couldn't work and couldn't lift in, in certain positions. So there were exclusion zones as well for RRV working. The, the RRV itself was about 30 tonne uh, and then by the time it's, it's jibbing out and lifting two or three tonnes of uh, hardwood timber, uh, we did have some restrictions on that as well and had to have uh, the designers had to analyse that, that part for us as well. As well. So a little bit about the timber specification. <coughs> Specified to use Greenheart, which came by boat from Guyana. It's a D70 grade timber, which is one of the highest. A very durable timber, resistant to most um, insect attacks, which is good, because we had problems at Barmouth many years ago with marine boring insects. Um, very, very good for, for marine environments, good weathering characteristics. But there is a downside to having excellent timber. It's really hard to work with. Um, we had to have special tools on site for, for cutting. We had to reduce the amount of cuts on site as much as possible because working this stuff, you see the sparks coming off a chainsaw when it's, uh, when it's cutting into it. Where are those sparks coming from? Coming from the timber, you know, coming from the chainsaw itself. It's, uh, it's good stuff. Um, we also, uh, the deck boards were, were Eki, which is, is very similar to Greenheart in some respects. It's a D70 grade timber as well. So access to the site was, was, was very challenging. That's an uh, aerial photograph of, uh, of the, the timber trestle going across the, ri yeah, the River Glaslin there, uh, yeah, 487, just to the north of it. Our compound was 400 metres away from the structure on the other side of a, a nature reserve. We had pontoon access on the other side from the Porthmatic side. You can go from Porthmatic and drive across the, the floodplain there to get access. Uh, main road access here to the compound. And then a, we did have a road in through this, an existing road through this, this wood. And the other the access track side was a, an access point here, enable the road rail, the road rail vehicles to bring materials and such like down from there. Um, so the access constraints, obviously, the, the, the estuary itself and the floodplain, triple SIs uh, working at height and, and, and over and above the water and in the water. And we also had to have a 150 mil gas main removed from the structure before we started as well, which was in the way. Luckily, it was dead. It took us several months to establish that it was dead, going around the various utility companies. <laughs> that gave us a little bit of anxiety. Um, yeah, so that, that map shows what we're faced with, you know, you name it, in terms of uh, nature reserves and, uh, and, and delicate habitat. Um, we had a lot there. National nature reserves, uh, Ramsar sites, which is wetlands, triple SIs, special areas of conservation, special protection areas, we had a lot there. So we had to have a, a FRAP license, which is a flood risk access permit that uh, allows us to work in the estuary. We also had some um, permits to allow us to work in, in the triple S size as well. This is a flood map. Um, you've got the, the viaduct here. This is a, uh, I think this is a hundred year flood uh, up to this, this hashed area here. Um, so flooding was, was identified as, as going to be a, a significant problem for us uh, with it being a flood plain. And when you plan a job in the summer and you think, oh, I can use this access and it'll be no problem here, and this is great, and then you turn up in February, um, we had a bit of a shock. Um, and this is, which, which, which is one of the, this is what caused us probably most of the problems. It's the floodgates of Portsmouth Harbour. So these floodgates were put in, um, I, I assume, just after the cob was built. The cob has got the road and, and the uh, Festiniog Railway on it allowed access to the rail and railway access to the uh, to the harbour there 
and these floodgates were put in to protect the harbour and protect the town from flooding. There's a big levee as well, a big embankment as well associated with this. Well, this holds all the water back in Traith Mower uh, and at low tide, with the right hydrostatic pressure, the floodgates open automatically and the water floods, uh, runs through the harbour. It runs quite fast through the harbour, actually. Uh, but yeah, so this, this caused us problems because it was holding all the water back. Uh, and when we had, um, when we had high, high, you know, high rainfall, uh, we experienced some, some difficulties. And then when the floodgates are open, it's a bit like pulling the plug out of the tap. You know, the flow rate under the structure increased quite, quite rapidly and caused our diving operation some issues, which I'll come to. So we did model, we did model the river um, under at the structure to uh, you know, enable us to predict what kind of water, flood levels we, could, we would experience and also flow rate. So divers working uh, partially submerged or fully submerged can work about, about one metre per second. So our analysis came out at, at less than one metre per second, but you know, getting, getting close to that. And that, that's an average and, and different parts of the river will have different flow rates. So where it's shallower, where it's deeper, Sometimes where it's deeper, the flow rate actually can be can be lower, but the more shallow areas, um, you know, the flow rate can increase due to that, due to the to less cross section. Um, again, the, t the tidal range we had was probably three and a half meters around about that, so we had to plan the work to be able to work at water level down here, and then water level, you know, almost up at the ceiling ceiling height. So uh, that gave us a, a few challenges as well, which I'll I'll describe. So all that in theory and in practice, and then you turn up and this is what you are, you know, this is what you're faced with. You've got flooding all the way up to the, to the flood embankment at Porth Maddox, so that's probably 600 metres away. Um, water level is a couple of metres below the soffit of the bridge, making it very hard to work off pontoons. Um, and and the, the, the access to the site was flooded right up to the site offices, again gave us problems. So this is the access road down to the to the to the structure, from the, taken from the site offices, and you see the guys are almost waist waist deep there walking down the access road. Uh, we had some pretty poor weather conditions in February, and you can see the pontoons got dislodged there. So we had disruption, and and um, we had to suspend work uh, during periods of, of the first blockade, which I'll come on to in a bit. Originally planned to complete all those uh, all those works in a nine block blockade at the end of, of, of February. Um, we planned it very very carefully with the critical path analysis um, and got it all in. But the reality was that due to the work suspension, we had to weigh all the, the float we had in the program. We had to come back in, into all the blockade blockades following that, two five day blockades following that in March. And we finished off um, in, in September. So the kind of activities that we, we had were sort of, for the diving operations were fully submerged, so you had guys fully kitted out uh, in helmets, um, underwater breathing apparatus, um, fed from, from the pontoons, so they're piped and tethered to the pontoons. And they could work a maximum of two hours underwater and they'd have to come out and change over, especially in February and March. It was very cold, the water was still very, very cold. It's still cold coming down from, from Snowden, as you can expect. It doesn't warm up there till, till much later in the summer months. And then we had the partially submerged activities. You can see a diver working there uh, at waist height. They work up to chest height, um, changing, changing the plan line. Access was afforded using with a, a, quite a large barge pontoon, which had stabilising legs and, and a hydraulic lifting arm. That did lots of the lots of the operations in, in the deeper water. We also worked from these plastic cellular pontoons, which were very good, very versatile, very manoeuvrable, enables us to get access under and alongside the structure. Um, these could be, um, could be made bigger or smaller by taking cells out and refitting them. Uh, we had boats in the water, both safety boats and, and boats for moving this kit around. Um, so that worked quite well and also for, for access for staff, 
engineers and the, and, and, and the, and the work gangs to get them over from one side to the other. We had these boats. So there's a couple of images showing us working from the, the scaffolds uh, on, on the pontoons. Uh, guys there fitting the handrails there. The divers also worked from the plastic pontoons and, and the metal barge as well. Um, and when, when we experienced the really um, high, uh, the, the poor weather conditions, we had to get extra divers in because the water was so high. A lot of the activities which we planned to, to complete uh, either you know, from a pontoon or partially submerged to go fully submerged on many of the activities. Uh, access um, to the top of the structure and the edge beams was using a 30 ton bigger crane and that worked, uh, that came in and brought materials in as well. So it had trailers that brought materials down from the site access uh, down to the site with two, two big bigger cranes working simultaneously on different activities. You can see the, uh, the crane working, the, the Giga crane working there, dropping edge beams in, replacing them. You can see in the background uh, another, another crane and, and the pontoon barge with the hydraulic arm as well working there. These, these guys, I know there's no edge protection here, but the guys actually were tethered. They had harnesses on and they were tethered to a, to a safety line uh, along, uh, that was on the railway there. So the guys are working safely there. Um, a couple of uh, short videos just to, to, to show the different uh, work activities. So this is preparing a pile on um, trestle four. Um, the pile, the existing splices were above the water line and we had to prepare them to put them below the water line because that actually preserves them better than, than being above the water line. So uh, I'll just play that short video. <laughs> Of, uh, from one of the divers inspecting one of the pile splices under the water in the deeper sections. You can see what conditions these guys were working in. So that's the new pile splice he took, he took a video of for us. So this was all installed in the water. Hands off to those guys that were working in those conditions. Okay, so um, this was um, trestle four. This was uh, where we changed the crosshead. You can see the new crosshead's gone in there. Um, the temporary works jacked structure up to enable us to slide this out and, and position it off the, uh, the, the, the giga cranes. Uh, see the corbel still to be replaced there and the old straps in there as well. Um, there's uh, an image of the, the hand railing being put up. We replaced the existing handrail with an FRP, uh, fibre reinforced plastic, um, really good stuff actually, uh, from Easy Clamp, um, attached to the new um, edge beams in there. Um, yeah, good those. There's some more photographs of, of the piles being replaced using block and tackle. Um, see the piles out there, a new splice position there. A new pile being, being positioned with, uh, with chains and pulleys. During the first blockade, um, the nine day blockade in February, um, because the work was suspended so many times, it was looking like we weren't going to get anywhere near the, the amount of work completed as we'd hoped. Um, and then the challenge changed to well, what have we done and what do we need to do to get it ready for, tr for trains running on Monday morning? So there's a bit of a panic there. You can see some of the engineers' notes there of uh, trying to 
trying to work out what we'd done and what we'd got to get done. So we had we had consultants, Cass Hayward on site. Uh, they were there, they were there anyway, but uh, they helped us establish which of the elements were critical to be in position. We did have some temporary straps um, before we opened to traffic, but it was quite nervy going out and making sure that these, these bits were complete. The access was so difficult. We've got 15 trestles, 16 spans, who's done, you know, multiple work parties on the structure doing different bits. Um, so to, to sort of work out what's, what's been done and what hasn't been done was, 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 was hard work. Um, I signed the Form 5 ent entry to service on, on the Sunday night before the train <laughs> before the train ran over it and um, yeah we, we, we got there in the end but it was uh, like I say we had to come back uh, there was quite a few piles which we didn't didn't replace which were done in the, in the second blockade and then the final blockade in, in September uh, we finished off uh, the deck boards which had been shifted to allow us access and then one edge beam that's all we did in the last blockade um, so uh, it was it was good in the end got there eventually but um, yeah I think um, the, the environment really really challenged us um, so um, originally planned all in one nine day blockade suspended several time, times during that nine day blockade so we came back in March for another five day and finished off in September I mean the railway's blocked till Christmas now anyway because of works at Barmouth in fact, in some respects, Barmouth's a little bit easier, really, because all you've got to contend with is the tide times. You haven't got to contend with a, with a floodgate, which uh, holds back billions of gallons of water, which uh, causes no end, of, no end of trouble. Um, and this was the last photograph I took, um, end of September. Finished job. Um, all shiny and new. I think there's a phase two to, to carry on. A little little video here um, that Easy Clamp took with some drone footage. <laughs> There is another animation here, it's eight minutes long. I don't know whether you want me to play it in its entirety or, or, or skip through it. Um, basically, I didn't show this at the start or at the point when we produced the animation. It kind of spoils the, kind of spoils the presentation because all the work activities were done in here. This allowed us to, to plan it you know, quite effectively um, and um, communicate with st stakeholders as well that, you know, that what we had planned was correct. We also got the tarp, we also got the tide levels in that animation as well and, and engineering wise it's quite accurate because it was taken from the engineering drawings and, and that, that 3D model that I showed you as well so uh, I'll play that. There's the cob at Porthmatic. Mauer um, flooding areas, pontoon access either side of the river, site compound and, and timber storage, this actual structure itself. We had quite a bit of anxiety as well, ordering timbers from Guyana in the middle of the pandemic. We didn't know whether, <laughs> we didn't know whether, the, whether the boat would work. So that, that's uh, pontoon working at, at high water level. And then the pontoon working at, at low water level. We're different options for, for for changing the piles. That's the pile splice, which I showed you the, the photographs of. The piles could be replaced using um, the block and tackle off the pontoon, or it could be replaced using the hydraulic arm on the, the bigger pontoon. Changing a diagonal whale in there. So 
So the, the, the animation was done um, was done against the program as well, so that helps you to sort of plan um, your sequencing. Again, it's, it's fairly repetitious in terms of you know, the same some of the similar activities being carried out on each um, on each lesson. I guess it's um, a good time to describe, you know, all the other parties that are involved. Um, obviously, got Network Rail, Wales and Western with the, with the client, Amco Giffin, the, the principal contractor, Cass Haywood with the, the, the designers, who had maybe uh, designed the, the temporary works. Uh, Easy Clamp provided the um, the handrails. Um, TMS um, Marine Services. Uh, provided the divers, it was RMS as well, uh, who, who got the other, you can see a frogman in the water there, not sure what he's doing. Um, yeah. It was a success in the end, but it was uh, you know, challenged by, by the weather conditions. Temporary works getting built up there. The crosshead was actually dropped through the deck. It wasn't dropped, dropped through the deck. We planned to drop it through the deck. We brought it in from the end. We brought it in from the side. It wasn't done like that. We brought it in from the side. We had a jacking system for the edge beams, which we didn't use in the end. We were able to, to, to move the, the deck boards out of the way to enable us to drop um, the edge beams in without using that jacking system. It helped. These edge beams go on forever, so I will skip forward on that. There's lots and lots of edge beams. That's the system that we didn't use, the temporary work that we didn't use in the end. Again, the handrail is similar. Very repetitious piece of work. that. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Did you take any questions or corrections from Fred? <laughs> the animation does, yeah.